Hi, I'm Patrick Cappiello, wine director at Gilt Restaurant. We're in the cellar of Gilt's million dollar wine collection. We're going to talk today about how you properly store your wine, whether it's uh, long term, short term, and uh, whether you have the ability to store a lot of wine or a little wine. I think the most important thing when it comes to storing wine is temperature, and it's something that doesn't always come to the forefront of people's minds. I feel like I often go to friends' apartments and they have their little wood wine rack that it seems to be sitting right next to their oven, which never makes any sense to me because you couldn't find a hotter place in your apartment if you tried. Ideally, storing your wine under 60 degrees, 58, 56 is ideal. For short-term storage, I think not having it go over 70 is the most important, but I'm talking short-term, like you're gonna drink it within a week or two. Um, you wouldn't want it to get over 70. I always tell people who don't have the luxury of having a giant wine cellar like this to use your regular refrigerator for red and white wines. I think that if you're gonna going to be holding on a wine for more than a few weeks. It's a special bottle. Maybe you want to have it on a special occasion. You don't want to leave it out because you're going to jeopardize the integrity of the wine in the long run by keeping it too warm. So a refrigerator will, will work. Nowadays, they're making a lot of smaller bottle wine fridges that can hold a couple dozen wines that you can keep in your apartment. If you own a home, in the basement of the home always tends to be the best place because it stays cool down there. It's moist too, which is probably the second important thing after temperature is moisture. And the reason why moisture is important is it keeps your corks fresh. Basically, when a cork dries out, it needs some sort of moisture. And if it's not in the environment that the wine's being kept, it's going to pull it from the only other place it can, which is from the wine, which is going to um, potentially bring oxygen into the wine and oxidize the wine. So thanks for joining us. I'm Patrick. Cheers. Hi, I'm Patrick Cappiello, wine director of Gilt Restaurants. The sommelier's role, I think, is to help a guest select a great bottle of wine and be there to help them enjoy it through the evening. The best use of a sommelier is to connect with them and not be afraid of them. Most of my colleagues and friends, I think, are all really nice people. We really genuinely want you to come in and enjoy your evening. That's our goal, that's, that's our passion, and we, we love to see people have a great time with wine. So the idea of us being stuffy old men who are grumpy and, and uh, opinionated, you should try to put that out of your head and, and, and look at the new generation of sommeliers that are friendly and fun. There are three things that you can tell the sommelier to help them really choose a great bottle of wine. First is your budget, and I don't think you should ever be shy about that. I mean, giving them a price range or you know a, a ceiling of, of amount of money that you want to spend is a great way to do it. Sometimes wines become better as they become more expensive, but there's not necessarily only options that are great that are expensive. Also, your taste preferences. If you tend to like fruitier wines or drier wines, I think that's important as well, full body or light body. You want to communicate all those things, and, and you don't need to have you know know, terms like wine tastes like blackberries or blueberries. Do more general terms. If you want it spicy, great. Say you want it spicy. If you like it earthier, tell them you want an earthier style wine. The era of smartphones has been such a help for us. I see people often taking pictures of labels and then having those labels in their phones and being like, you know, I drank this wine one time at this restaurant and this was really, really great. That really opens the door for us to be able to use those wines as a launching pad into other wines. I think in the end, best using a sommelier is to look at them as being somebody who's there to help and someone who really cares for your experience, not only wine, but with your dining as well. Hi, I'm Patrick Cappiello, wine director of Gilt Restaurants. The sommelier's role, I think, is to help a guest select a great bottle of wine and be there to help them enjoy it through the evening. The best use of a sommelier is to connect with them and not be afraid of them. Most of my colleagues and friends, I think, are all really nice people. We really genuinely want you to come in and enjoy your evening. That's our goal, that's, that's our passion, and we, we love to see people have a great time with wine. So the idea of us being stuffy old men who are grumpy and, and uh, opinionated, you should try to put that out of your head and, and, and look at the new generation of sommeliers that are friendly and fun. There are three things that you can tell the sommelier to help them really choose a great bottle of wine. First is your budget, and I don't think you should ever be shy about that. I mean, giving them a price range or you know a, a ceiling of, of amount of money that you want to spend is a great way to do it. Sometimes wines become better as they become more expensive, but there's not necessarily only options that are great that are expensive. Also, your taste preferences. If you tend to like fruitier wines or drier wines, I think that's important as well, full body or light body. You want to communicate all those things, and, and you don't need to have, you know, you know, terms like wine tastes like blackberries or blueberries. 
Do more general terms. If you want it spicy, great. Say you want it spicy. If you like it earthier, tell me you want an earthier style one. The era of smartphones has been such a help for us. I see people often taking pictures of labels and then having those labels in their phones and being like, you know, I drank this wine one time at this restaurant and this was really, really great. That really opens the door for us to be able to use those wines as a launching pad into other wines. I think in the end, best using a sommelier is to look at them as being somebody who's there to help and someone who really cares for your experience, not only wine, but with your dining as well. Hi, I'm Patrick Capiello, wine director of Gilt Restaurant, and today we're going to talk about corked wine, one of my least favorite subjects. So corked taint itself is known as trichloral anisole, which is also known as TCA, basically a byproduct a chemical compound that occurs when a certain airborne fungus meets uh, some sort of chlorinated product, whether it's a cleaning product or a pesticide. And uh, if it gets inside the cork and then the cork in turn gets put in the wine, you'll see the infection transfer into your wine. And not a harmful thing, so if you accidentally drink a wine that's been infected by cork taint, it's not going to hurt you, so you don't have to fear for that. The way you detect cork taint is primarily through the smell of the wine. A lot of times the cork will smell as well. Uh, that's why you see traditionally someone is smelling corks before they serve the wine. But ideally it's more about whether the, the wine is infected with the problem, not necessarily the cork. So, when you get a taste poured at a restaurant or whether you're at home and you're tasting, uh, just pouring a small pour and, and swirling it and smelling it. The smells you're gonna be looking for are kind of a musty smell. Um, it's a smell that I smell often in cardboard or um, it even can occur like in sweaters that are stored someplace that's a little bit more moist um, and it can actually stick with you for a while. It can occur in wines in small amounts and be kind of a more of a background noise or it can be something that's really um, intense and really pollutes the whole wine. That's why a lot of winemakers are turning to screw caps or synthetic corks as alternate closures, which can ensure the TCA not being infected uh, through the cork itself. Thankfully, this wine's not, to, not infected with cork taint, so we can start drinking. Uh, I'm Patrick Capiello. Thanks for joining us. Cheers. Hi, I'm Patrick Capiello, wine director at Gilt Restaurant. Today we're going to talk about how you swirl your wine. So, one of the most important things when it comes to swirling wine is not to overfill your glass. It's an error that I see people make often. And uh, once you do that, you give yourself a higher risk of spilling out of the top of it when you're swirling. So, a smaller pour is a better pour, especially if you're an inexperienced swirler. Another tip that I give to beginner swirlers is uh, keep the foot of the glass on the table or on the bar where you're sitting. And uh, if you grab the stem almost like a pencil with your, uh, with your finger and your thumb and just draw small circles on the table or on the bar, that's the best way to, to really get a feel for how it works. And the more you do that, the more you kind of get the vibe for it. And, and as your experience gets better, you can pick the glass up off the ground. And before you know it, you're uh, practically twirling plates on a stick. So. The reason we swirl our wine is to expose the wine to the oxygen that's in the glass. And that brings out the aromatics of the wine even more. So if you ever just have a glass of wine that you pour it and just pick it up and smell it, you'll definitely smell something. But as an experiment for yourself, if you then swirl the wine and go back and smell it again, you'll notice that all those aromatics that you first sm smelled are exploding out of the glass. And there's actually even more intricate aromatics that you didn't notice at first that are there. It's almost using the glass as like a, a wine amplifier. And, and that swirling really intensifies all that. Thanks for uh, joining us today. Cheers. Hi, I'm Patrick Capiello from Gilt Restaurant. Today we're gonna talk about why we smell wine. So one of the reasons why we smell wine is to first of all detect any sort of flaws in the wine, whether it's a cork taint or uh, an oxidation issue or a matterization issue. Smelling wine, I think sometimes people can be a little bit uh, too aggressive when they do it. So I always tell people to smell wine like you were smelling a flower. So kind of just lightly 
lightly breathe in through your nose. Sometimes I think keeping your mouth open when you're, when you're breathing in will allow you to not pull too hard. Um, and it just allows you to kind of get the, the top aromatics, the, the more subtle aromatics in the wine. And then as you work your way in a little closer, you, you can breathe a little bit fuller and, and then also get some of those more rich aromatics as well. But the thing you're looking for, again, a flaw first, but then after you've established the wine's good, the most important thing is to smell it, to enjoy it, and to experience what's so explosive about wine it tends to be very much about the way the wine smells. Thanks for watching. Cheers. Thank you.